Howdy, so today I'm going to do part one of many disassembling this black box and just going through the way that the logic boards inside interact with one another. Um, basically, what I've learned is only from the ARINC 542A specification. Um, having read it a couple of times now to figure things out, it, it defines uh, the plugs on the rear, the airports on the front or the other way around. I've, I've yet to figure out front and back. Um, basically the pinouts, the signalling levels, how the, a plane talks to the black box. This is a Fairchild specific connector. I don't have the documentation on that of the black box for how to talk to it. But I do have enough details that with the correct power supply this could be turned on. Which is pretty cool. Uh, along with a power supply repair this has a slightly grumpy power supply. Um, so basically what I'll go through is more or less inferred from that documentation as to how each particular part works and what the, the jobs of each part are. Um, so I'll go through that. I may get it wrong, I may not, but it should be a really good idea of how this thing works. Um, so next I will pull it apart and I will take all the boards out and go through each one. Right, so we'll start at the power supply end, so oh, they're really in there good and proper. Uh, see, what I might do is relocate the camera so it's pointing much closer to the table and shift the black box out of the way. Right, so first card we've got is a power supply. Um, fairly simple. I believe there's a couple of little high frequency transformers inside the black box casing. Outputs no 12 volts at 400 hertz, and this regulates that to 12 volts DC. Uh, it's it's got a few rails on it. It's got 8.5, 5, 12 and negative 12. It's also completely blown up at one point so this capacitor here, I believe it's a capacitor, needs to be replaced. Um, it looks like everything else has survived which is good. Um, so this is the one to be repaired to actually power the black box again. Right, now I've recharged my battery. <coughs> I've gone through the power supply we'll get into the slightly more detailed parts of this. Um, just to note, so the power supply is 115 volts AC at 400 hertz. Um, now 542A was designed as a, an in-between. Uh, ARINC 542 is for foil recorders. The old recorders with the, the foil that it would scribe lines on. Um, in the 80s, the FAA mandated that all planes had to have them scrapped and replaced with digital recorders. Uh, that was a fairly expensive retrofit for the airlines, so basically 542A was developed, which let you put a digital flight recorder in place of a foil recorder without actually having to redo anything. It just worked. Um, because of that, the actual data coming in is 20, 20, 
28 volts AC at 400 Hertz. Um, so a lot of this is conversion. Right, so the next card I will pull out uh, is a pair here that actually do the same thing. So I'll pull out the pair. I'll try and pull out the pair. Definitely put it well. And here's the other. So these two are the Sync uh, Digital Multiplexes. Um, basically, all the data coming in is 20, 28 volts AC, um, but at 12 bit words. So basically a single word, so you've got 8-bit computers and 16-bit computers and 32-bits and these days the words are 64-bits. The data being sent was 28-bit, 12-bits. Uh, uh, and what these do is these multiplex all those different signals coming in. So you've got all these different signals and what the cards do is they come in and come out as a serial string. Just one. Lots and lots and lots and lots of 12-bit words. Um, so these are fairly important. Very clever. Um, multiplexes have been around a while. Standard PC hardware uses multiplexing, multiplexing, especially where a chip shares address and data. So it's got to multiplex the address and the data together on the pins with timing. Um, yeah, so there's two of them because one of them is for... Aaron 542 Extended, and I believe Extended is for things like 3rd uh, and 4th Engine, uh, a few other parameters that, that, that weren't actually recorded on foil recorders. So newer planes could use the older system but record more data. Tapes are brilliant for that. Um, right, moving on. Put these cards aside. Yep, the side of the black box is labelled, so... Fairly easy to figure out where they live, plus each type of card only fits its particular slot. Um, so we have here, this is the sync digital converter. And basically the sync goes in, um, and there's only one card, so I believe this it goes in after it's multiplex. So the two multiplexer cards take all the sync signals, make them a stream, feed them into here, so sync signals in, and good old binary ones and zeros out the other side um, with that whole bunch of headers and uh, there's all sorts of stuff that gets you to say this is a sync word, this is a sync word, this is a sync word, this is a sync word. So this deals with turning the sync data into binary data that you know a computer understands and you can record digitally to a tape. It's pretty impressive all the IC componentry of the time. This is all fairly new when this was built. Um, obviously recorders now use flash drives and they're a lot smaller and hardier, but... Right, so I'll pull out the next card. Uh, sit that up there. What have we got now? Now, this is another pair, but this is a strange pair. That one. And this one. Okay, so these cards are Interface 1 and Interface 2. <coughs> now, I am actually unsure what the Interface cards are for. I have a feeling that um, for the front port, these are the cards that deal with talking to the black box to retrieve its data and interrogate it. Interface kind of makes sense. Uh, it may also be to do with there's some programmable uh, inputs on this black box. So some of the inputs aren't necessarily you know, set. Uh, part of the Aaron spec and part of the design of the black box is that you can program some special inputs, which I'll get to some of the um, things that are down there. But the other thing interface cards are likely for is there is the programmable uh, inputs also take binary. 
So these could deal with the binary words going straight into the processor with no multiplexing, none of that. They just get put in. Um, again, it's hard to find documentation on how these work, so it's a lot of inference. Uh, if I can power it up, I can start feeding things in and see what happens. So a power supply design is kind of high on my list. And what's odd with this interface card is there's a lot of test points left on it. Uh, test point something, there's a solder blob in the way. Test point 9, test point 10, again a manual for the black box would make this pretty simple. Um, right, moving on to the next card. Put that pair up there. What are you? Ah! This one is an analog to digital converter. Um, these days, the entire job of this board would be done by one single chip. Uh, again, very early semiconductor manufacturing, there probably wasn't a chip to do that. Uh, readily available at the time. So this one is the analog to digital converter, so analog signal in, digital signal out. Again, I believe it's, it's either the programmable inputs or the gyroscope. Um, or accelerometer, sorry. Uh, the accelerometer was a DC input, not an AC input. So the, the, the accelerometer output may have been variable voltage DC, an analog signal, hence analog to digital to converter to convert the, the uh, accelerometer signal into 12-bit data. This is one of the more complicated cards uh, compared to the uh, interface one, interface two. So these are all very, very simple in comparison. But this analog to digital card, a lot of this on here is shielding. Um, I'm assuming to try and keep as much noise away from the tracks, from adjacent tracks as possible. So it's very well shielded, very well assembled. You don't get equipment built like this these days. Um, uh, what have I got left in here? Two amps. Okay, I'll come to them next. Next, not oh, later. Next, we have the brains of the outfit. The CPU board. Ah, check that I haven't run out of my 10 minutes yet. Whoop. Right, so next is the CPU board. Now. This is the bit that's odd. Um, hang on, I'll come back to this in a second. Right, so, various chips here. This, this is a ROM containing software for running the actual black box itself. It'll be a PROM. Uh, this is a RAM chip. I can't find anything about it. I don't know how big it is. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to take a crack at finding out how much RAM this is, because there's nothing. Uh, the model number is EDH8808ACL-15DMHR. That's yeah, all I can find about it is it's a memory chip. No one seems to know how much memory. Uh, this is a programmable peripheral interface. Uh, I'm tipping it will take in the 8-bit words to deal, the 12-bit words to deal with, because this is an Intel microcontroller, and it's an 8-bit microcontroller, so no 12 bits, 8 bits. At a guess. Uh, at a guess, this does some 12-bit to 8-bit peripheral work, or it talks to the tape drive, or both. Uh, this is an Atmel EEPROM, uh, 8, uh, 16, 8, 2 kilobytes. Um, two kilobyte EEPROM. This was this board itself was manufactured in uh, nineteen eighty eight, I believe. Uh, so a two kilobyte EEPROM would be incredibly expensive. Uh, this is looks like uh, cuttable links, so cut the links to configure certain things. Uh, and yes, the Intel MCU. So the, the brains of the outfit is an Intel microcontroller. 
Uh, now, what I forgot to point out earlier is all chips used in this across all the cards are CMOS chips. Um, basically, there are two major advantages. One, they're very, very immune to noise. As any sort of noise shouldn't hurt them as much. Uh, number two is when they're not actively doing things, they draw very little power. CMOS chips don't draw a lot of power unless they're switching states, and then it's a very, very quick, brief power spike. Uh, so they run a lot cooler, which is probably good. Right, so, next card. I actually do the next two cards as a pair again. Uh, so we've got this one. And we've got some very old style looking card here. So this is a right amplifier. This is a read amplifier. Now the read amplifier is a lot more complicated. Um, yeah, so we'll start with the right amp. So now I can actually determine which one's which if I pull out this. Okay. Now I've just got to clear this out. Awesome. It was the way around I thought it was, but I just had to be sure. I'll just lay this back down. So, right amplifier. Binary data comes in here. Um, it doesn't seem to do a lot of amplification. It seems to be missing quite a few bits that I would guess to be amplification. It must be doing something. Um, so, the binary data from the CPU comes in here. This side connects to the right hand. So on um, this, this is in, this is out. Um, and this writes the actual data to the... Yeah, it does a little bit. Can't quite tell what. But this is the bit that does all the work. Um, so this one's the right amplifier. I suppose it just makes sure that, that, that the data getting written blows away the old data, but my assumption would be that if you're amplifying it, it only amplifies to a point. But I'm assuming it would blow it away, usually. And some flaws with that black box, which I'll get into. And this one, which is very old-fashioned looking, is the right ampli uh, read amplifier. So, data's read from the tape here. Uh, fed to each amp and then spat out here. Now I don't know if these are for reading the individual, each one per track. So I believe there's six tracks on the tape. So it sort of runs through to the end of a track, loops, drops down a track, then loops back, drops down a track, and it might let you read all six tracks at once. Mm. Fetch the data quicker, let a computer sort out what comes in, which actually sounds very, very logical to me. So you'd just, you'd have the one track right head and then six track read head, and then it could read all six tracks at once because you don't want to be sitting around waiting for it to read all the data. You'd want to read it as quickly as possible. Um, so I believe that's what that one's for. So yes, um, Amplifies the, the binary getting written on the tape, amplifies the binary being read from the tape. I'm, gu I'm guessing so both ways it's a nice strong clear signal and sort of magnetism of the heads. Now I've got to pull out the last two cards, so... Right, so the last two cards. Um, these are a bit different to everything else. This is the altitude card. This is the airspeed card. Now, they actually take inputs directly from pitot tubes. Um, rather than have some converter somewhere else, again, <coughs> the spec being for uh, foil tape, uh, they actually take them both in. Now, funnily enough, airspeed also accepts the feed from the altitude input. So it takes the altitude air input plus the airspeed input. Um, not quite sure why. Uh, now with the design of these, I think these may be what put out the analog signal. 
and these might be what go to the analog to digital co converter. Um, no schematics means it's a bit hard to figure out how they work. Again, I'm just inferring from design here uh, how it all happens, so I might be way off. I just don't know. Funnily enough, it's a little bit hard to get schematics and diagrams on how all these things work. Um, now, the design of the two boards is actually, they're remarkably similar. Very, very similar. Yeah, um, there's only a few components difference between the two boards. Uh, so there's two missing resistors here, resistor gap, resistor gap. Two missing resistors here, two resistors, however that gap's higher up. Um, there's a couple of differences up here, here. Essentially I think they function almost identical to one another. The differences is just for the, the output really. Um, they've both got the same serial number just a different model number and part number. I think these are a matched pair. I think the airspeed and altitude sensors were manufactured together. Um, <coughs> apart from that, yeah, they're, they're very similar. Um, I suppose it saves on manufacture too. One PCB has slightly different component set, two different cards. Right, now onto the fun part. I'll just put these up and out of the way. Tape drive. So, yeah. Now, unfortunately, I can't fire this up. It's actually run by a servo. Uh, I don't have a servo controller floating around at the moment, so I can't pulse that input to actually drive the tape player. But what I'll do is I'll get it all apart and I'll run it by hand. So you can see how it all happens. Right, so let's do some more disassembly. Screwdriver went. I'll get this cover plate out of the way. Fairly clever design. Uh, so this is power. Uh, this one is for the read and write heads. We've gone through the read and write amp boards, so I'll go through the two heads uh, once I flip it upside down and take that apart. So it's interesting banding. They're plastic bands. You get a bit upset if you spin them up too quick. So, uh, the reason the flywheels are here is this is designed to handle small blips in power uh, without stopping recording. And so I'll go into its small technical flaw here. Uh, it was brilliant. It would keep recording if the power blipped. Not a problem. There was a fault with the CPU board where in a power blip it would jump back to track one. And there, there were actually a couple of crashes where that had happened and the investigators found that they had nothing to go with because it had track jumped uh, and they just ended up with an indecipherable mess. Uh, quite a few times the data that's come off these has been corrupt as well. Uh, a few years back the French BEA actually investigated banning these in French airspace on commercial airliners because they were so unreliable. Um, many a story of a frustrated investigator who's had to investigate an air crash with one of these and found it had absolutely nothing useful on it. Poor old Fairchild must have had a really hard time back then. Right, so, I'll just... It's heavy, but it is designed to, uh, stand an air crash, so it's not exactly thin. Right, even more protection. So, let's get this section apart. It's like one of those Christmas presents, you know, where it's 
You think you're getting a really awesome present, but it's like 30 boxes inside one another with this tiny little thing in it. However, the Christmas present inside a flight recorder is infinitely better. Right, so there's the recorder unit itself. Now, all that work for this. So it's, it's an endless loop tape. The tape is manufactured as a big loop and wound and put together and woe on the person who pulls this section out, which I am, I'm not doing. I would hate to try and rewind that tape. Um, right, so here we have our read and write heads. Now they don't physically move up and down the tracks. The right head, the right amplifier board Grab these boards back. So the right amplifier board will. Is that right amp? Yeah. So the right amp board will output to a particular track depending on the track coming in here. So one of these will get the signal and it will amplify it and output it here and it will get written to the tape. Whereas the read board, the read head, whichever one's read, will read all six tracks at the same time and output them all at once because you're trying to read quickly you're not trying to you know, read one track at a time you want everything off the flight recorder so it, it lets you read six times as fast um, for an idea on that I believe it's a 24 hour loop so take 24 divided by 6 Four, four hours, um, four hours to read off the entire tape. Um, just so you can see it in operation, let me just, uh, first, I'll oh, check that the camera's pointing at it. Oh, look at that, I got it right today. And I will manually wind the flywheel. So the tape comes in from the inside of the spool, runs through the rollers, past the heads, past the capstan, and then back onto the outside. So it runs inside to outside. And it will just run in that loop forever. If I sat here for 24 hours, I'd end up right back where I began. Or well, not 24 hours, 4 hours. So 4 hours and I'd end up right back where I began. It's a pretty clever design. Um, very, very well protected. Right, so now I'll get onto the wiring of the box itself. I'm just going to put this back together. Hate to be the poor person who um, sat and assembled these day in, day out. And of course, as this has none of its weather seals, it would. I don't think any way that this type can be recertified. I don't think they like certifying this particular model black box. Um, just because of its fairly checkered past. Plus digital flight recorders these days are you know, all round cool. I wouldn't mind getting my hands on a digital flight recorder to pull apart. When in doubt, apply more force. I don't think that quite works as well in this case. More force might break it. I don't want to break it. Ordinarily I'd do this on the workbench, but I'm trying to get a better angle from the opposite side of where I'm working. Hopefully it makes it a bit easier to see, I'm not sure. Again, as I like to point out just about every time I do this, I am still learning. I am, however, getting the hang of it. Just get 
Okay, so I'll button back up. Alright, I'll pop this unit aside and we'll get up the, the now empty main unit. Oh, this is going to be a pretty jigsaw puzzle to put back together. Oh, it's so much lighter now. Oh, main unit. That's obviously where all the cards live, tape recorder. Um, I'll flip it upside down so you can see that part. Um, oh, I need to flip it upside down now anyway. All hand wrapped. This wasn't machine stamped out. Some poor soul sat there for who knows how long manually wrapping all the wires. Can't say I envy them that job. Oh, it's lost a weld. Cannot envy them that job. I think I'd go insane after the first day. So these are all the wires to the communications that are not the ARINC standard. Not sure how they work. Air, power for the, the recorder. Everything here is wrapped. Now, it actually makes it difficult for me to get a better inferral of how all the parts work together because I'm not particularly keen on unwrapping all that. Everything's tied in these pretty little knots. Uh, if I undo all that and end up with a wire mess everywhere, I'll never get it to look this neat, so hence part of the reason a lot of its functionality is in here. Um, huh. So these are the two main inputs, power, signalling, everything that all comes through. It appears to be all the blue wires pretty much. Anything blue I think is a signal. Anything white, or well, white goes to the front ports. Colours on the back side of them. Oh, there's some whites. I actually think all the blues are the darters. Mostly, I am potentially wrong. Here are our high frequency transformers. Ah, uh, 10. Ah, oh, I can't see it. Cenotaph. 31. Okay, so this transformer's 10 volts, and this one's 31 with a center tap, so if you tap off 31, it's 15.5, uh, uh, which probably regulates down to the 12, and then there's a tiny little 25 here. Uh, you know what? I don't know if the camera can see that. Oh, yes, it can. There's a little 25 here. Um... I would love to say I know what these are. H I G ink 2B A 1B 112 Cont 2A blue bead. I really I've got no idea. I've never seen anything like them before. Um I might have to look that one up. So yes, all hand wrapped. A lot of time went into that. Um Got a resistor here too, by the look of it. Are you a resistor? 50 watt, 40 ohms. Yes, you are a resistor, but I don't know what you're resisting. Apparently resistance is futile. I haven't a clue. Um, it appears it connects 
to ground. Why is there a resistor connecting straight to ground? Well, look, it's there for a reason. I don't know the reason. Uh, anyway, this has been part one. Part two will probably be where I put this back together again. Uh, I have an incredibly pretty little jigsaw. Putting it back together could be entertaining. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, sorry if it's too long. Um, thanks for watching.